Hello everyone, hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, I, it's a bit intimidating watching the numbers going up here. It's uh, now 178 on my computer. I recognize a few names. The reason I've been asked to do this is for a bit of background. I'm, my, my job is editor of news at STV North. Uh, but as a reporter, I covered many trials, uh, many murder trials. And I also produced and executive produced three series of a program called Unsolved on Grampian TV and STV. And the programs looked at some of Scotland's most intriguing unsolved murders. That was back in 2004 to 2007, three series in total. We looked at 18 cases and I was interested to see a name coming up there, a Sue Black. I assume that's the esteemed Sue Black, who in the aftermath of one of the cases got involved. I'm not allowed to go into that in much detail for reasons I'll explain later. But firstly, when you're covering uh, unsolved murders or when you're involved in a series like this, what are, what are the main uh, objectives at the start? Well, firstly, you have to assemble a team. And being Grampian TV at the time, we didn't have a huge budget. So it was quite a small, close-knit team. The key thing was to get two really good researchers. I also did research, and so did the reporter who was on the programme, Isla Traquere. So we all kind of mucked in at the start to research. And my brief to the team was, when you're, when you're phoning people, when you're phoning relatives of victims, or you're phoning experts, or you're, you're, you're phoning the cops, don't arrange anything over the phone. Always arrange to meet them, if possible, face to face. You want to look into their eyes and get them to trust you. That's why it was so important that we had the right mix of people involved in the team. We also had to get the cooperation of police forces. So the first series concentrated on unsolved murders in the north of Scotland. The north of Scotland being from, from Perth upwards up to Orkney. In the second series, we went into the Central Belt, and the third series was mainly the Central Belt. We covered 18 cases in total. Uh, gaining people's trust, as I said, is the main thing. But the other thing I said to the team was, we're not detectives. We're not investigating these cases with a view to solving them. That's the job of the cops. These cases are unsolved because the cops, for one reason or another, couldn't bring anyone to justice. All we are doing is retelling the story of the investigation at the time and hearing from those most directly affected. The other thing that's important when you're, you're doing programs of this nature is good, strong storytelling. Everyone is fascinated by true crime. Everyone is particularly fascinated by unsolved murders. Why is that? Well, search the internet and you'll see all kinds of reasons given by psychiatrists and psychologists as, as to why the public are obsessed with this, because it's normal to a point. Evil tends to fascinate us. The battle between good and evil has existed forever. The 24-hour news cycle and the 24-hour entertainment cycle with the rise of channels like Netflix, the Crime and Investigations channel, who, who among us hasn't watched either Making a Murderer or even the, Tiger, even the Tiger King during lockdown? It also helps us feel prepared. There's, the, the, there's a fear of crime out there and you feel if you watch any of these programs that you're somehow protecting yourself against crime. We're also glad we're not the victim. So we're kind of detached when we're watching these programs. We're also glad we're not the perpetrator. Watching programs of this nature, it also gives us a bit of an adrenaline rush. And it also becomes a bit of a whodunit. We're trying to solve the mystery, especially if it's an unsolved mystery. We all like to think we know who did it. And finally, we kind of, as human beings, like to be scared or shocked in a controlled way. So when we're making these, these programs, 
because the budget was small, it was quite difficult because it involved quite a lot of reconstructions and we couldn't really afford to pay professional ac actors to take part in some of the reconstructions, all the reconstructions that we were doing. So we were roping in uh, amateur dramatic groups in the various locations that we were filming at. We roped in just about every single relative that every member of the production team had. I had a part in at least four of the programmes. We then have to, off the back of it, you have to get a really strong editor to pull the pieces together so it all holds together as a compelling story. They would each half an hour in length with a break in between. And at the break, you have to have a hook. You have to have a hook that maintains the audience's interest and draws them in. And this is a kind of this is a kind of shock value where you reveal something that's going to be explored in part two that gets everyone thinking, whoa, I need to get the kettle on quick, get my tea, and come back to find out what happens in part two. And we also explained to all the relatives that agreed to take part, look, we're not trying to solve this. Uh, it's up to you whether you want to take part, but we found that predominantly, and it's a question I'm often asked, why do people bear their souls and reopen old wounds to talk about cases that shattered them so many years ago? And what we, what we found is that for, for the families of, and friends of victim, it didn't matter whether the case was 40 years old, 10 years old, or one year old. It was as if it happened yesterday, and they were clinging to any hope that a perpetrator would be brought to justice. So without further ado, I'm going to talk about three cases today. You'll probably be familiar with all the cases, uh, though you won't be familiar with some of the detail, and there are different aspects of each case that I want to explore. There are two unsolved murders, and there was one unsolved murder that has subsequently been solved, which I think you'll find rather interesting. And you'll find it interesting how the perpetrator of that killing was brought to justice. So the first case I want to concentrate on is one of the most baffling and infamous cases in Scottish criminal history, one that is known as the doorstep murder. Picture the scene. It's November the 28th, 2004, 7 p.m. Alistair Wilson and his wife are putting their kids to bed upstairs in, the, in the, one of the rooms of their detached villa in Nairn. Now, Nairn is known as the Brighton of the North. Previous to the events that happened, there had only been one previous murder in Nairn 25 years before. It was a, a stabbing at a wedding. So while Alistair and Veronica are reading their two kids' bedtime stories, and they're also babysitting for another 18-month-old 18, 18 child that night, the doorbell goes. Veronica thinks that will be the parents of the 18-month-old child. Why have they rung the front door? They normally just let themselves in the back. So Veronica goes down the stairs and goes to the door. She's met at the door by a man in a baseball cap, and he, he asks for Alistair Wilson by name. Now, the only account we have of what happened that evening is from Veronica Wilson. There were no other witnesses to what actually went on on the doorstep and in the house. So this gentleman asks for Alistair Wilson by name. He's described as white, 35 to 40, stocky, dark baseball cap, five foot six to five foot 10 in height. Could really be anyone. He was clean shaven, wearing a dark blue bomber style jacket and dark jeans. Veronica goes up the stairs and she says to Alistair, there's someone at the door for you. He goes down and he's down at the front door talking to this individual for two or three minutes, and he comes back up clutching an envelope. The envelope is turquoise blue in color, and it's one of these that's kind of A4 envelope, like I, 
an envelope you would put a birthday card in. Now, police didn't reveal it at the time, uh, but the envelope had the name Paul in it. And according to the police and according to Veronica, there was nothing in the envelope. So Veronica and Alistair have a conversation about the envelope and just the weird, the weirdness of the situation. For all intents and purposes, the chap downstairs had gone away, but Alistair goes back down to try and get an explanation as to why he was handed this envelope and to see if the person was still there. Veronica continues reading the bedtime stories to the children and she hears what she describes as being like wooden pallets falling. And she thinks, that's a bit odd. And she goes down the stairs and to her horror, she finds Alistair lying dying on the doorstep. He's been shot twice in the head and once in the stomach. And she also catches a glimpse of the killer wandering round the corner of the lane leading up to their house. All hell breaks loose. Veronica is completely distraught and we interviewed her for the show Unsolved on the first anniversary of the murder and she was still reeling and in complete disbelief as to what had happened. And I'm just going to read you the transcript from, from that interview uh, and it will give you a sense of the sheer panic that was going on in the house at the time. And we weren't told it by police in the immediate aftermath, but her four-year-old son had followed her down the stairs and had seen his father dying on the doorstep. The two-year-old had remained upstairs. And also in the house that night, apart from the child they were babysitting, was Veronica's father, who was living in the, the granny flat upstairs. So here's what Veronica said when asked, and it was me that interviewed her on the first anniversary for Unsolved. I asked her, what happened next? And you get a sense from this transcript as, as to the, 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 the bubble, as she described it, that she was still in. I just, it's, it's complete disbelief. So I, I don't know what to do, right? Police, ambulance. I run to get the phone. I've got the kids upstairs. I've got kids and the phone is upstairs anyway in the middle floor. So I'm running up, screaming to my dad. He lives on the top floor. He comes out and I'm telling him he has to take the kids. He has to take the kids. Al's been shot and I'm scrambling to find the phone. And I phone 999, but I'm running back down the stairs the whole time. Dad's met me. He's taken the kids to the bedroom and I'm running down the stairs. Just this, you know, this, this doesn't happen to us. It can't. It can't be real. But I'm running and I'm phoning through to 999. I come back to Al and I'm just asking him to hang on. I just think I can't help him. I can't help him. So the whole time I'm on the phone to 999, giving the details of the address. And I can run across to the bar across the road, knowing there'll be people there. Somebody has to help. I open the door and I just don't see anybody that I know. And at that point, I've been put through to a paramedic. So I run back to Al and they're talking me through it. You need to get towels. So I run to get towels and I come back down and he's starting to tell me what I should do next. And I just, I just look. This is my husband. I can't help him. I can't do this. So I run back to the bar. I see people and this time I just scream, Al's been shot. I don't even know what, what, what I've said, but I need help. I presume I told them he'd been shot, but I just need help. And this time people come back over and try to help. At that point, I hand the phone over to somebody because we're still talking to a paramedic for them to take over because I just can't do this. There's just blood everywhere. It's my husband. He's been shot. And then shortly after that, the police arrive and they start trying to help me. And then the paramedics and it's all happened. Although it seems so long, it's all happening so quickly. And just the whole time it's disbelief, disbelief. It's just shock. This hasn't happened. You know, it, it's not Al. How could it be? But from then on, it's paramedics and police are taking care of the situation. So hopefully that gives you 
some sense as to the, the sheer horror and panic that night for Veronica Wilson, how an ordinary night in the sleepy, quiet town of Nairn, known as the Brighton of the North, a peaceful, one of the most peaceful towns in the north of Scotland, how that peace had been shattered. And from then on ensued a massive police investigation. In the early days, there were no clues. No one could find out or work out why bank manager Alistair Wilson had been shot. The couple had moved to Nairn 18 months previously. Alistair had been involved in business banking and his patch was Orkney to Oban. And he basically advised businesses on strategy and arranged loans for, uh, for business growth. He'd previously worked in Edinburgh. He then moved to Fort William where he met and fell in love with Veronica, then married and moved to Nairn. So the first thing police do is try and establish a motive. Veronica and the kids were taken to a safe place that night and remained there for quite a number of days because for all intents and purposes, there was a gunman on the loose in Nairn. So in looking for motives, what do the police look at? Firstly, is it a crime of passion? Was either Veronica or Alistair having an affair and it was a disgruntled lover? who had taken out his wrath on Alistair. Was it a disgruntled bank customer? Had Alistair refused someone alone? Had, had that person's family broken up as a result? Had the business collapsed and he was taking out revenge? Was Alistair involved in any criminal activity? Was it a professional hitman that had been sent north to kill him? Was it a random killing? Had someone just turned up at the doorstep and shot him? Or was it a mistake? So as police dug deep into these theories, they realized they couldn't find anything in Alistair's background that would suggest any of these motives fitted. There were also various theories about what might have happened. A, on the 12th anniversary, a chap called Peter phoned the BBC and said that a friend had told him he'd been doing some work for a Highland businessman with links to a former loyalist paramilitary group from Northern Ireland. The Bank of Scotland did the banking for at least one of the businessman's companies. When the friend started to question the businessman about the work they were doing together, he threatened him and his family and said he owned the guns. The police say they're still looking into Alistair's business background, but there's nothing to suggest, and they've spoken to the businessman in question, but there's nothing to suggest that there's anything untoward. So what the police had to do then was try and find out, try and find the murder weapon, and someone did their job for them. 10 days after the murder, the gun used in the killing was found down a drain three quarters of a mile from the house. It was found by roadmen clearing, clearing drains. It was a Hanel Schmeiser weapon, a tiny gun, probably about, probably about that long. Uh, about 40,000 of them were manufactured in East Germany uh, before World War II. Uh, the gun was so small that it was known as a lady's gun, so-called because you could hide the gun in the palm of a lady's hand. It's also known as a pocket pist pistol. You could hide it in your waistcoat. You could hide it in, your, in your, your socks. One would suggest this was hardly a weapon of choice for a killer, certainly not a hitman. So police, having discovered the weapon, thought we finally got a breakthrough. The gun was sent away for analysis, but to their misfortune, no DNA was found on the weapon. And the weapon, they've sent it away several times and it still doesn't yield any DNA. The trail went completely cold 
all the Alistair Wilsons in Nairn were interviewed. All the Alistair Wilsons in the north of Scotland were interviewed. There were about 18 Alistair Wilsons, would you believe, in, in that area. Uh, the police following following the lead that it might be mistaken identity, but that that came that came to nothing. There was also suggestions that Alistair had connections to Gangland Glasgow. Reports claimed he'd borrowed fifty thousand pounds from moneylenders close to the criminal under, underworld. Police wouldn't go into any detail on whether Alistair was in any financial trouble. And certainly the policeman involved uh, at the time, the, the chief investigating officer, said they could find nothing untoward about his financial dealings. And as the years have gone by, more elaborate theories have come to light. A chap called Peter Blexley, who works on the channel, a former police officer who works on the Channel 4 series Hunted, has written a book about this case. And he claimed in the book that Livingston Football Club could be involved in the Alistair Wilson murder. Livingston was forced into administration early in 2004 by the Bank of Scotland with debts of £7.2 million just hours after a League Cup semi-final win over Dundee. And it was thought by Peter Blexley that the board that were involved in Livingston at that time had taken their wrath out on Alistair Wilson. Again, no link was established. So on the first anniversary, when we were about to make our unsolved program, the trail had gone cold. And it was quite unusual to choose this case because most of the unsolved cases we were doing were at least 10 years old. But I think the police were quite interested in us taking on this case because they had no real leads. So ahead of it, and I, I, I took the lead in arranging all the interviewees, and we interviewed, we interviewed just about everyone that, that was involved. We interviewed the road sweeper that found the gun. We interviewed journalists that were involved covering the story in the, in the early days. We interviewed Alistair Wilson's sister. We interviewed Alistair Wilson's best friend. And we also interviewed Veronica. I had to go and see Veronica in her house prior uh, to the interview. And the police had a liaison officer who sat there. And the instructions I was given before going into the house was, you can talk to Veronica about anything, but don't talk to her about the envelope. And I said, why not? because the on envelope is specialist knowledge. And you often find this in major inquiries that the, the police keep back specialist knowledge from the public because it will only be known to the killer what that specialist knowledge is. And it's something that they will have in hand if they ever arrest or even charge something. So I met Veronica that night and she was still, and she described she was still in her bubble she still, she was a woman who came across as completely bewildered. So my job that evening was to try and persuade her to take part in our programme. Now, she'd taken part in quite a few press conferences uh, for the police and she was not comfortable. And some people are just not comfortable in front of camera. And the other thing about Veronica, when she, when she did her kind of public appeals, she didn't come across as your archetypal murder victim's loved one, in this case, widow. Veronica didn't really do tears. She wasn't weeping, gnashing and wailing in front of camera. And we're kind of fine-tuned to expect that when we see press conferences from loved ones who've been caught up, who've, who's who's husband, wife, loved one has been brutally, brutally murdered. Veronica just wasn't like that. And there are other people who are just not, not like that. But I found her completely convincing when I interviewed her. And I just felt such sympathy for her. She spoke about 
being in the bubble. She went through the events of, of that night and she just, in the, the exact detail that she'd gone through it with the police in public appeals a hundred times before. Nothing in her story deviated. She agreed to take part in the show, but while I was in the house, one thing struck me. I, 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 was, I, I was looking at the stairs that Veronica had come down to find Alistair dying on the doorstep. And one thing struck in my mind, Veronica in her account of events had spoken about how when she got to the doorstep, she spotted the killer disappearing, walking, not running, just walking round the corner. And I'm thinking to myself, if a hitman comes to the door, A, he doesn't hand someone an envelope and then tells him to go back upstairs and then waits for him to go back down. Surely a hitman would shoot him on sight. And also, having shot him the second time he came down the stairs, surely he bolted and he'd have, he'd have disappeared long before. And I actually put this to the chief investigating officer at the time, Peter McPhee, and I said to him, Peter, I just find something just odd about the, the, kind of the chain of events that night. And I went through how Veronica had said she'd come down the stairs, she'd found Alistair dying on the doorstep, and then spotted the killer. I said, surely the killer would have been bolted and would, would have been well out of sight. And Peter McPhee said to me, ah, Donald, what if he came back? I said, what do you mean, what if he came back? He came back for the envelope. And the envelope with the name Paul in it has never been recovered. Veronica agreed to take part in her programme. The police got some calls off the back of it. The BBC did a similar programme, but sadly, it didn't yield any clues. And all these years on, the murder of Alistair Wilson, while still a live investigation, remains a mystery. And on every anniversary, coming up to November the 28th, every year, we go through the motions of going to the house. Veronica still lives in the house with her children, one of whom will now be 20, the other 18. We go to the house, knock on the door and ask Veronica if she'd like to do an interview because we're doing a piece on yet another anniversary of a crime that remains unsolved. Now, most of the time she turns it down, turns us down because really she doesn't have anything to add to what she's already said. We'll keep asking. She did, she did speak to the BBC that did a radio documentary and she spoke to them last year. But it's, it's not really in her interest just to keep going over old ground. Every significant anniversary, and by significant anniversary, I mean an anniversary with a five in it or a 10, the 5th, the 10th, the 15th, the 20th, news organizations like ours go big in it. You know, we get the cops, we go back to Veronica. And uh, Nicole, if we, play, if we play the first video now, this is... This will give you a flavour of what we do just about the end of every November, every year since this brutal killing happened. So I'm going to play quite a short video uh, just to give you a sense of how we've been covering it. Police Scotland say it's absolutely committed to finding the killer of Nairn banker Alistair Wilson. The 30-year-old was shot on the doorstep of his home in the town 12 years ago. A massive police inquiry was launched after the mother of two was killed, but his murder remains unsolved. Ross Gavin's report. Gunned down on his own doorstep. 12 years on, there are still no answers as to why banker Alistair Wilson was shot in an execution-style killing outside his home in Nairn. Despite a massive police investigation, his murder remains unsolved. Today in a statement, Police Scotland said it remained absolutely committed to finding Alistair Wilson's killer. It says the investigation remains active and ongoing and the force has appealed for the public to come forward with any information they might have. 
The 30-year-old father of two was shot at his front door after his killer handed him an envelope. A month later, the German-made handgun was recovered from a drain in the town by a workman. Forensic analysis identified it as the murder weapon, but tests failed to extract any DNA. Despite interviewing almost 3,000 people, police have made no significant breakthrough. Alistair Wilson's widow, Veronica, who was inside the house with her young family at the time of the shooting, has also appealed for help in finding the killer. It's still very, very unreal. Um, and I feel it will be until somebody is captured and then we are then left to grieve as a, a normal family. At the end of the day, there, there is still a murderer out there and we just, he needs to be caught. Twelve years after his death, the family and friends of Alistair Wilson are still searching for answers and justice. While his cold-blooded killing continues to cast a shadow over a town still baffled by his murder. But police have used today's anniversary to emphasise the hunt for his killer continues. Ross Govins, STV News. Hopefully that gives you a sense of what we do every year. Police are still baffled. The people of Nairn are baffled. It's cast a dark shadow over, over the town and will continue to do so until someone is brought to justice. I'm going to leave the last word on this case to Alistair's loved ones because sometimes it's easy to forget the havoc that's wreaked in people's lives as a result of these cases. We interviewed Alistair's sister. We spoke, we spoke to his parents who declined to, they were really, really, they were really nice, but they just felt they couldn't go on camera so, uh, to do an interview. They were too traumatized, but Alistair's sister agreed to speak to us and she, she was living over in Australia and we hired a freelance crew over there, Gillian, Gillian Bynan, and she agreed to do the interview and we sent a, a list of questions that, that we wanted asked. And one of them was how, how firstly, how she'd remember her, her brother. And she said, he was the person that made me smile, the person who sent me funny birthday cards and postcards, the person that, I shared my life with. We talked about careers, moving forward, getting through university. He was a very special person to me and I miss him a lot. She spoke about the importance of bringing someone to justice for the crime. She said it's incredibly important to us. It'll give us all the answers as to why for the accused to stand in court and tell us why he did it. It'll make a big difference to us. It's not going to bring Alistair back, it's not going to change the result, but it's going to give us some answers to enable us to move forward and try and lead a normal life. And poignantly, her, her last memory of Alistair was going to visit him in, in the morgue. His body had lain in the morgue for some considerable time uh, because he was a murder victim. Alistair had expressed a wish to be cremated on his death, his last wish was not granted because in Scotland, you don't cremate murder victims. She told us, Veronica and I went to see Alistair at the morgue and it was a very, very upsetting time, a very upsetting thing to do. He was positioned in a way we couldn't see his injuries and it didn't look like him somehow. He looked angry, he didn't look at peace. And I think that's what remained with me for the next few months until we were able to bury him. I knew he wasn't at peace where he was and we needed to lay him to rest. And that's her last memory. And the, the final word I leave with, with Veronica, who's, whose life has been completely shattered, who has tried to go on as normal for the sake of her children, but life for Veronica will never be normal again and one can only imagine the the horror she says she'll carry the images of what went on that night in her head forever it doesn't make sense the only way this will make sense 
for me is if it's solved to find out who and why. My husband will always be murdered, but to actually know who and why will help resolve some of the things that are going on in my head. I just don't understand where this entered into our ordinary life. I asked her what she felt about a whispering campaign in Nairn that she was somehow involved. And when there's no breakthrough in a case, when there's a void, people try to fill it with their own theories. And just about every reporter who has worked on this case over the years, myself included, will have been asked by people, do you think Veronica was involved? I put that question to Veronica. What do you say to people who are behind the whispering campaign that you might be involved? And she said, people that think I have something to do with this, they have no idea now what we're going through. How could I take away my two sons, father, my husband, my rock? Al would have been the person that would have got us through anything like this happening with any tragedy that happens in our lives. Al was my rock. People just don't know me and that's not what we're about. We were a family. We were together. I asked her how she'd remember Al. I'll always just remember him as Al, big Al, my soulmate, my rock, just a special person. We're now going to move on to the second case and this one is quite unusual in that it's not unsolved, it's been solved, but I thought you'd find the mechanics of how it was solved interesting. And like the Alistair Wilson case, this is a murder that shattered a quiet, peaceful community. In this case, the community of Orkney. Now, Orkney's not renowned for being a violent place. It's a place where uh, a broken car wing mirror can make it into the local paper. There had only been one previous murder in Orkney in 25 years when the peace of the community was shattered on the evening of Thursday, the 2nd of June, 1994. And the reason I'm talking about this case is it's highly unusual in Scotland and indeed in the UK because this was a racist killing. And racist murders, though they happen, are very, very rare, thankfully, in this country. So it was the evening of the 2nd of June, 1994, about eight o'clock in the evening. It was a beautiful night in Orkney and at the Mumitas restaurant in the center of Kirkwell, there was quite a crowd of diners in uh, waiting for their meal. Shamsuddin Mahmood, one of the waiters, was serving a table that included the Glue family. Now, the Glue family are quite a well-known family in Orkney. Donald Glue was there with his wife, his kids, and his brother-in-law and his wife had traveled up from London. So as they were being served by the waiter, Shamsuddin Mahmood, the door opens and a man walks in. He's wearing a balaclava. He's wearing a hooded top. He walks up to the where Shamsuddin Mahmood is serving the Glue family. Donald Glue actually thought it was a joke, that it was someone coming in in fancy dress. This chap was holding a gun. He held the gun to Shamsuddin Mahmood's head at very close range and fired. The bullet went through his left eye, passed through his head and lodged in the wall. The bullet casing landed on the floor. The killer then calmly, calmly turned round and walked out of the restaurant. He was chased by Donald Glue and his brother-in-law, but as they were running after him down a lane, they thought, he's got a gun, are, 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 are we mad? 
and the turn back. The waitress who was in the restaurant that night working alongside Shamsuddin, Marion Flaws, she'd fled out the door of the restaurant when it happened and she caught sight of the gunman running down the lane. Again, chaos ensues. Why would anyone want to shoot Shamsuddin Mahmood in, in cold blood? Now, Shamsuddin had come to Orkney that summer to work at the Mumataz restaurant. He'd also been there the previous year for about eight months. He was working to get enough money to to be a lawyer. He wanted to be a lawyer. He came from a large Bangladeshi family. His brother worked as a lawyer in London. Most of the family were over in Bangladesh. He had nine brothers and three sisters. No one could understand why anyone would want to shoot Shamsuddin Mahmood. So like the Alistair Wilson case, the first thing the police have to do is try and establish a motive. A Bangladeshi waiter is shot in cold blood in Orkney. So what could the motive be? So detectives were taken in from the mainland and because a helicopter or a plane wasn't private plane wasn't available to take them up to Orkney, they had to drive from Inverness through the night up to Scrabster and then get a boat across to Orkney to join the local police, the small number of local police who were involved in the case. So the first thing was establishing a motive. Was Shamsuddin on the run from a drugs gang, perhaps? Was it an ethnic feud and someone had been sent to the island to kill him? Was it a dispute over money? Was it something to do with gambling debts? Or was it indeed a contract killing? So the more police delved into the background of Shamsuddin Mahmood, the more doors closed. They couldn't find any reason why anyone would want to, to shoot Shamal as affectionately known to people in Orkney. Now, the only tangible clue that the police have, because there was a lack of eyewitness sightings that night, people, people had seen a man acting suspiciously, but there were no there, 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 there was no kind of close-up sightings of anyone dressed the way the killer had been. So the only tangible clue that they had in the early days was the bullet casing that had landed on the floor of the restaurant. And it was established that this bullet was manufactured at the Kirki Arsenal in India. And there was about 50 million of them manufactured just after World War I. And a batch of about 40 million was bought by the British Army, but most of the Kirki bullets were found to be defective and millions upon millions of them were dumped into the sea. So that was the bullet that was fired out of the nine millimeter self-loading pistol that was used to kill Shamal. So the first thing that the detectives did was they tasked a local officer, police constable, Eddie Ross, who was a firearms expert. He came from a military background, He'd been in the special branch, he'd been in the green jackets, uh, he, was, he, was, he was a gun enthusiast. He had a large collection of guns at his home in Orkney. So they tasked him with trying to find out if anyone on the island owned a pistol or had the same bullets that were used to kill Shamal. So he and Orkney, it, it had a very active gun club in those days. So quite a few uh, licensed nine millimeter pistols were, were discovered. And Eddie Ross test fired all of them and the bullets were sent away for analysis. But unfortunately for the cops, they yielded no clue. So they still couldn't find the, the bullet that had killed the waiter. Now, two days after the murder, there was a development 
when a woman called Lynn Railston came forward to police with some information. She didn't think whether it would be significant or not in the inquiry. Later on, it turned out to be particularly significant. She said two weeks previous to the murder, her and her daughter had been had spotted this person, this young man in Papdale Woods, uh, close to the local secondary school in, in Orkney. And they'd been observing his behavior for about half an hour. He had a hooded top, he was wearing a balaclava, and he was, he was dashing in and out of the trees as if he was on maneuvers. So he would hide behind the tree then rush off again, hide behind another tree, tree. And they were so intrigued by this unusual behavior that they got a set of binoculars and they were watching him through the binoculars. Now, eventually, the young chap put down his hooded top, took his balaclava off and put it in, in, in the rucksack. But they caught a really good glimpse of what he looked like. So Lynn Railston, she didn't know who it was. She went to the police and told them this, and she was told, look, if you spot this person again, this young chap again, please tell us, uh, and we'll have a chat with him to see, see what he was up to. So meanwhile, the investigation into the murder of Sham Sudan was going cold. It was June that it happened, and by August, there was still no breakthrough until police got the most astonishing lead. And it came from one of their own. It came from police constable Eddie Ross, who had been tasked with trying to find out if any gun on the island was capable of firing the fatal bullet or whether there were any of the Kirki bullets on the island. In conversation with the senior investigating officer on the case, Eddie told him, I've got a box of the Kirky bullets in my house. And the senior officer was completely and utterly gobsmacked that Eddie was coming out with this information and asked him where he'd got them. And Eddie wouldn't say where he'd got the box of Kirky bullets, but he told him it's an unopened box. So Eddie was sent off home with another police officer in tow to bring the box into the police station. So he comes in and sure enough, it's an unopened box of Kirky bullets. Eventually, under considerable pressure from the police, he tells them that the bullets had been given to him by a former Royal Marine, a chap called James Spence, who worked as a road sweeper in Orkney. And he'd taken the bullets with him when he left the army. James Spence is interviewed by the police and he tells them he gave Eddie Ross two boxes of bullets, one the Kirky bullets and another 0.22 bullets. And he's adamant under questioning, he only gave the two boxes. Three weeks later, three weeks later, Lynn Railston's daughter spots the guy that had been acting suspiciously in Papdale Woods in a shop in the center of Kirkwall. And she sees the distinctive white t-shirt that he was wearing when he was acting strangely in Papdale Woods. She goes home, tells her mum, the cops have a, a, are alerted and they discover that the young man in question is the son of police constable Eddie Ross, 15 year old Michael Ross. So this takes the investigation down a completely different route. Michael Ross, 15 year old Michael, is questioned in the presence of his father and he denies it's him in Papdale Woods. Nothing to do with me, mistaken identity, why would I be there? He's then questioned again a few days later, and this time he admits it is him. And he gives an account that he was waiting for a guy to come out of the school that had 
abused a girlfriend that he'd been going out with. It was a dispute over a girl and he was waiting to kind of to, to, to give him a doing or to teach him a lesson. The cops by this stage are beginning to piece a picture together of what might have gone on. Three days after Michael Ross admits he was the chap in Parkdale Woods, they interview the road sweeper, James Spence, again. On this occasion, James Spence tells police that on three occasions, Eddie Ross had approached him and said, if the cops come anywhere near you, make sure you tell them that you only gave me two boxes of bullets, 1.22 bullets, and only the one box of the Kirky Arsenal. James Spence tells police that he did in fact give Eddie Ross three boxes. Two of the boxes were one an open box of Kirky bullets and one box of Kirky bullets that had been opened. This throws a complete new complexion on the investigation. A search warrant is obtained and police search Eddie Ross's home. And in Michael Ross's bedroom, they find a black balaclava with holes for the eyes and mouth, a deactivated nine millimeter submachine gun that had been given to 15 year old Michael as a present by his father. Who gives their son a deactivated submachine gun as a present? They also found a notebook or a jotter with markings on it that aroused their suspicions. And on, on one page, there were two chevrons, the two chevrons for the rank of corporal and the name Ross written on it. The zero in Ross was a swastika. They also found a Scottish salt tire with death to the English written on it and a banner kind of headline saying death cures all. Three months later, Eddie Ross is suspended from duty and charged with perverting the course of justice by withholding information in a murder inquiry. On May the 27th, 1997, he is jailed for four years at the High Court in Inverness for perverting the course of justice. During the trial, unusually, his son Michael is named as a suspect in the murder investigation. However, at that stage, police did not have enough to charge Michael with the murder. So unsolved, the unsolved team come into the equation in 2004, the 10th anniversary of the murder. We decide that this will be one of the cases that we're going to highlight. Again, it was me that took on the bulk of the trying to persuade people to take part in the program. And I have to admit, it's, it's probably the toughest, it's probably the toughest task I've ever had because the community of Orkney had kind of closed up and everyone on the island knew that the policeman's son was the prime suspect in the murder. Everyone on the island knew that Eddie Ross had gone to jail, gone to jail coincidentally protesting his innocence. He said that the road sweeper was mistaken. He didn't say the road sweeper had lied. He's consistently said the road sweeper, James Spence, was mistaken. But he went to jail and we really, really struggled to get people to, to talk to us. So I met with Donald Glue and his family at their home, lovely family, and they'd taken part in a crime watch just weeks after after the murder, but they hadn't they hadn't spoken since. And Donald agreed to meet me and he gathered the whole family round the kitchen table, his two girls who'd been in the restaurant that night, himself and his wife, and he got me to explain what we were doing why we were making the program, what we hoped to achieve, and he listened to everything I had to say. They had, they had a brief family discussion, and then I was invited back in, and he said, they've decided, reluct somewhat reluctantly, he decided not to take part in the program. 
He wished us all the best. He really wished that the killer of Shamsuddin Mahmood would be brought to justice, but he couldn't take part because one of his daughters was still suffering from pretty severe trauma from what she'd witnessed in the restaurant that night. So of course, I said, absolutely, absolutely fine. I hope we manage to, to, get, to get justice for, for Shamsuddin Mahmood's family and for the people in the restaurant that night who for the rest of their lives would never forget what they'd witnessed. The other thing that I, I, I need to point out, though the police, the, 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 the police didn't have enough to charge Michael Ross, they told us uh, in our interview with them for the 2004 documentary that they believed the killing was a racist killing. They believed that the killer was undergoing some rite of passage and at, he, needed, he needed to kill a black person to move into adulthood. Strange that that was to believe, for me, that's what we were told by the police. I next met Marion Flaws, the waitress who was in the restaurant that night. And Marion, she's a very, very quiet demeanor. I must have spent about two and a half hours trying to persuade her to take part because I felt it was important that we got someone who was actually in the restaurant that night to give an eyewitness account of what they saw. Now, I think I have a gift for getting people as a journalist, getting people to open up and talk about some pretty horrific events. And I think a lot of that has got to do with, I, I don't breach people's trust. If I tell them, this is, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, this is what we hope to achieve, I'm, I'm not going to break that bond of trust because the minute you do that or the minute anyone in our team did that, word would spread. We live in a small country. The media is, is, is quite a small, close-knit community. Word would get around that. That Donald John McDonald's not to be trusted. And Marion, I just... We got on great, but every time I asked her, would, would she please take, she just kept saying no, no, no. I must have been about on my eighth cup of tea when she finally said, you know what, I'll do it. Now, she didn't have much to say, but what she said was hugely important. And the reason programs like Unsolved are important, I said earlier, we're not, we're not the cops, we're not reinvestigating, but by highlighting you might prick someone's conscience, conscience. You might trigger a memory by someone who hasn't come forward. And if you've got interviews with people who were directly involved at the time, that's more likely to, to provoke a response, evoke a response from, from people. Unfortunately, our program went out and there were a few calls to the police and Interestingly, in, in, in the course of my research into this, someone sent me a letter at Grampian TV in Aberdeen, an anonymous letter, and the letter read, Every, everyone in Orkney knows who killed the waiter. It was the son of the policeman. The policeman went to jail, stuff, stuff we already knew, but it was interesting that someone would write an anonymous letter to me at Grampian TV with that information. So the case kind of went cold again until two years after our program went out in 2006, when a chap called Willie Grant walked into Kirkall Police Station, Kirkall Police Station, with an anonymous letter and just left it on the counter and walked out. And the clerk in the police station recognized him, that's Willie Grant. And in this letter, he said he'd been carrying guilt around since since the murder, he had seen Michael Ross in a toilet opposite the Mumitas restaurant on the night in question. He'd taken off his balaclava and he was carrying a gun and he was walking away from the scene. This threw new light on the case and gave police the additional clue 
that they were requiring and the additional piece of evidence that they were requiring to charge someone. A cold case review of the case was launched and Michael Ross was charged with murder. Now, by this time, a 2004, when back to 2004, when we were making Unsolved, Michael Ross was in the army. He was in the Black Watch Regiment. He was a sniper. And he'd also been involved in an incident where an armored personnel vehicle that he was in command of had hit a roadside bomb and two people had been killed and he'd helped, he'd helped rescue the others. So he was mentioned in dispatches and he was also commended for his actions. So by the time the unsolved murders case went out in 2004, he was an Iraqi war hero. And by 2006, he was serving in Northern Ireland when he was picked up and arrested by the cops and charged with murder. At his trial at the High Court in Glasgow, it was a six week trial and the jury were told that it was a racist killing. And one of those who gave evidence who'd been in the same cadet force as Michael Ross in Orkney told him that Michael Ross had said to him that all blacks should be shot. So after a six week trial, during which Michael Ross was walking in and out of court because he was out in bail, the jury were finally sent out to deliver their verdict and they came back and Michael Ross was found guilty of murder. Now the drama didn't end there. He swallowed in the dock and then he leapt out of the dock and ran out a side door of the court and started bombing it towards the front door of the High Court in Glasgow. He was rugby tackled by a court usher who brought him down and then another more people kind of piled in. When he when he, when he was he was taken to I think he, he was initially in Shots jail about a week after the murder, Tesco, a nearby Tesco, about a mile away from the court, Tesco was sealed off and a thousand shoppers evacuated because they'd found a hired car that had been used by Michael Ross going to and from court. When they opened up the boot of this car, they found a rucksack with all the kind of gear that you'd need to survive in the outdoors, a tent, other camping gear, three hand grenades, a loaded machine gun, a scorpion machine gun capable of firing 840 rounds of ammunition a minute, this was a gun that Michael had smuggled from army duty in Kosovo in the back of a TV set. And at close range, this machine gun is quite devastating. Asked about why his son would have an arsenal of weapons in the back of his car, Eddie Ross told documentary makers for the Crime and Investigations channel that I don't believe, regardless of what he had in the car, that he was intending to do anything other than look after himself. A firearms expert described the gun as, he said, that's not the kind of weapon that you would use to survive in the great outdoors, to catch fish or to kill wildlife. And a forensic psychologist on the same crime and investigations program said that when it comes to a profession which shows a lack of interpersonal consideration for others, being a sniper is probably second only to an executioner. Because in both cases, your only purpose in life is to actually kill other human beings. It was two to three months later before Michael was sentenced at the High Court in Glasgow and Nicole if you could be so kind as to run our next video. Tonight, the former army sergeant has been jailed for a minimum of 25 years for the racist murder. His victim's family say they're glad Ross has been punished for his evil deeds. Court. 
Tyson security was in place this morning at Glasgow High Court. Michael Ross still faces charges over his alleged attempt to escape from the dock after he was found guilty back in June. The 29-year-old was convicted of murdering Bangladeshi waiter Shamsuddin Mahmood in an Orkney restaurant in 1994. This police video shows the aftermath. A bullet hole in the wall, a shell casing on the floor, Shamsuddin's glasses lying on a table. Ross shot him in the head at point-blank range. He was 15 years old at the time. This morning, Ross's defence counsel said he was a loving husband, devoted father and distinguished soldier. Donald Finlay QC said Ross, a sergeant in the Black Watch, was still protesting his innocence and would fight to clear his name. The father of two was then given one of the longest jail terms imposed on a murderer in Scotland. Sergeant Michael Ross stood in the dock with his back straight, his hands handcuffed in front of him, his face impassive as the judge passed sentence. Lord Hardy told him it had been a vicious, evil and unprovoked murder of a defenceless man, a premeditated, racially motivated assassination with a firearm witnessed by families, including children who'd been left traumatised. Lord Hardy said much had been made of Michael Ross's bravery in the army, but the murder, he said, had been an act of cowardice. He jailed Ross for life and ordered he should serve a minimum of 25 years before he can be considered for parole. Ross's lawyers will appeal against his conviction and the length of his sentence. David Cowan, STV News, at Glasgow High Court. That appeal was subsequently rejected by three judges. Michael Ross, the, there's a campaign to try and free Michael Ross. If you go onto the internet and, and Google uh, justice for, for, for being for, justice for Michael Ross, you'll see there's, there's quite a vociferous active group on there. They've, they've raised quite a bit of money and they've engaged the services of human rights lawyer Amar Anwar to try and present the case, a case to the Scottish Criminal uh, Review Organisation to, to have uh, Michael Ross's conviction overturned. While he's been in jail, Michael Ross has tried to escape on three occasions. He tried to scale a fence at Shots Jail. He stole a saw from a prison workshop. Uh, he'd already tried to bolt from the dock and he also tried to escape from a prison van while on a hospital visit. He wrote a letter to the campaign group fighting to clear his name and he said, for me, planning an escape is like seeing an open door to the outside world. For me, not to take the opportunity to walk through the door is madness. It's only natural for captive animals to want to get out of their enclosure. He says that by trying to escape, he's highlighting the injustice of his conviction. Meanwhile, his wife and his two children have to live life without the, the father of, of the kids. Had he admitted his guilt at the time, he'd be out and he'd be enjoying watching his children growing up. I leave the was last word in this case to Shamsuddin Mahmood's brother. Uh, his brother's wife had to undergo psychiatric treatment as a result of the trauma uh, she underwent following Shamsuddin's murder. Uh, on conviction, uh, his brother, the lawyer Bulbul, said, I feel bad. Britain is known to be a racially tolerant society. Of course, there are isolated incidents of racial violence, but generally, I would say it's a racially tolerant society. And such a racially motivated crime should not have happened. Our brother lost his life due to racial intolerance, racism. Michael Ross will be released when he's in his, in his mid-50s. Shamil Mahmood would have been nearly 70, a full life behind him murdered for the colour of his skin. The final case I'm going to touch on, and I'm conscious of time, but this, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief with this one, is again one of the most baffling unsolved murder cases in the history of Aberdeen. And this was the murder of taxi driver George Murdoch. And this was unusual in that it was a stranger to stranger killing. Now, 
stranger to stranger killings are notoriously difficult to solve because in most cases the victim is known to the killer or it's a crime of passion or it's a fight gone wrong you know there it, jails jails are full of young men who went for a night out carrying certainly in in central scotland carrying knives carrying blades they didn't go out intending to kill someone but the very fact that they were carrying a knife is enough to convict them of murder because by carrying a knife you have the weapon capable of murdering someone and i'm 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 i'm, I'm struck when i when I see some of the, I've been in quite a few prisons, uh, not not as someone who's been convicted, but uh, as a reporter, I've been in quite a few prisons and I, I'm struck by some of the, the real young faces that have just ruined their lives, who are serving life sentences because of a stupid, senseless act. So George Murdoch was a taxi driver in Aberdeen, 37, uh, 58 years of age, and this murder took place on September the 29th, 1983, so it's 37 years ago, and it remains unsolved, and it's known as the cheese wire murder, so anytime the press refer to this case, it's always called the cheese wire murder. Dodd, as he was known, was from Maastricht in Aberdeen, he was a family man, three brothers, two sisters, married to uh, Jesse. Uh, they had no kids, but they had a, a dog, Patchy. He enjoyed a drink at weekends. He, he, loved, he loved his family. He loved his brothers and sisters. He liked going fishing. Uh, he liked, he liked to, to bet on the horses on a Saturday. He liked the, the bingo, and he liked his racing pigeons, though by all accounts he wasn't very good at training them because they always used to fly off and, and not come back. So George had had various jobs throughout his career, but was, was working as a taxi driver when he was brutally slain. He was, he was driving a city, city taxi number 333 on the night of September the 29th, and he'd started his shift at 4 p.m. and was due to finish at 2 a.m. At 8.35, he radioed the controller and told him he'd picked up a fare outside the old Markleff Hotel on Queen's Road in Aberdeen, and he was heading for Cooter, nine miles west of Aberdeen. Five minutes later, two cyclists cycling, cycling up Pitfoddle Station Road in Cults just on the outskirts of the city, spotted two men outside a taxi on the ground with what looked like they were fighting. They saw the assailant get up and go into the front of the cab. A small sum of money and George's leather wallet was stolen. So they were only 16 years of age and they were too scared to intervene. They didn't shout, they decided to cycle and phone for help. So they cycled to the Cults Hotel, uh, just about a mile away, and they used a phone box there to phone the cops. But by then, two other motorists driving up at Fordle Station Road had come across the taxi and found George dying on the pavement beside his cab with pretty severe head injuries. They alerted the, the woman who lived opposite the police were called, an ambulance came, and about 10 past nine that evening, George was certified dead at hospital. There was no sign of the assailant. Taxi drivers from across the city all headed for the area, looking for someone that might be, that might be running away, someone acting suspiciously, but no one saw anything. And one of the unusual things about this murder was found at the scene was an 18 pence cheese wire with wooden handles. So that was one of the only tangible clues that police had to the murder. And if you go onto the internet and Google George Murdoch murder, you'll see some reports that George had been garroted by the cheese wire. It's not the case. The cops didn't say it at the time, and 
sometimes sometimes there's probably police listening to this who will contradict me sometimes sometimes police allow some sensationalist reporting to get out there to try and prick the conscience of someone and get a response get a public response so rumor swept the city of Aberdeen that George Murdoch had been murdered by a cheese wire when in reality it was he'd been strangled and he'd severe head injuries consistent with his head uh, banging off the the side of the road so the cheese wire murder read, led led to them going to who would use a, an 18 pence cheese wire well it's used in colleges schools restaurants shops uh, potters use it it's used for putting in windscreens and cars it's used for cutting core samples in the oil industry but it yielded it yielded no clues it was a massive inquiry and it was the first time that the police in Aberdeen had used a computer in a major in, in investigation but they had few clues to go on and they were really frustrated at the lack of public response even though the killing had shocked the city they weren't getting people coming forward in droves uh, with any information there was a man seen running back towards the city he wasn't dressed to be a jogger so there was a huge amount of effort to try to put in to try and trace that man to no avail they held house house to house inquiries they staged a reconstruction and it wasn't until 19 days after the murder as part of their house to house inquiries that a woman who worked in mr chips in the city's manifield area a fish and chip shop said recalled a man coming in the night of the murder around 8 45 9 pm ordering ordering a meal but he was bleeding he was bleeding from his hands his hands were all scratched he looked disheveled after giving him his supper he asked for a plaster he also had scratches on his face police found it incredulous that it took the woman 19 days to come forward to report this sighting immediately the focus of the inquiry was on this man that was spotted in the chip shop it was a massive line of inquiry celtic were playing aberdeen at petaudry the following saturday and police were there in force checking the hands of anyone matching the description they'd been given of the man in the chip shop five five eleven thin short dark hair and a fringe black or navy crew crew cut jumper black leather bomber jacket jeans good trousers with narrow bottoms jeans or good trousers with narrow bottoms again it yielded no clues and the trail went cold a reward of a thousand pounds was put up at the time by a local businessman the police took more than 10,000 statements they spent 37,000 man hours on the case still nothing they appealed to wives and mothers where were your husbands that night where, where were your sons nothing so by the time unsolved came to do a program on this it had been 25 years since the murder was elapsed and what struck me when we were doing the research and doing the filming for that particular episode of Insolve was the impact that this had had on police senior police officers who'd failed to crack the case but also some of the witnesses who were involved we spoke to a former police detective inspector Warren Soudan who spoke of his frustration at not being able to solve the murder he said the team worked 12 to 16 hour days for the first six to eight weeks flat out coming to work in the dark going home in the dark never seen their wives or their families for days on end i'm still annoyed we didn't get the killer of george murdoch but you can only give your all and once you've given it there's nothing more to give warren Soudan went to his grave still not knowing who killed George Murdoch. There was also huge frustration at the stranger to stranger killing. Another detective 
told us, how do you find a stranger who suddenly, out of the blue, decides to murder another stranger? We lacked a little bit of luck, but the inquiry was still running 12 months afterwards with just as much vigour as it was in week one. We interviewed the late brother of George Murdoch, Jim. Now, Jim, was when we interviewed him, he was dying of cancer. He knew he only had months to live, and yet he wanted to go on camera to make one last appeal to try and find his brother, the killer of his brother. He described George as a perfect brother. He would have stood by me and I would have been standing by him. No question of that. And I can still hear his rasping voice as he's talking to the camera. I just want whoever is caught to suffer now. If they're caught, hopefully they'll be in prison till they die. One of the cyclists, one of the 16 year old cyclists, now, now a working man spoke to us. He was still all these years on too scared to go on camera to be identified in case the killer was still out there. Again, the program didn't really yield any fresh clues from police. The George Murder case is still being investigated by Grampian Police's major investigations team. And two years ago, and it's now the impact of it has spanned the generations. George, George's wife died, according to the family. She died of a broken heart. She was never the same again. And now his nephews, his nephew has come forward to offer a reward to try and find his uncle's killing. And his wife, the nephew's wife, Robina Mackay, has written a book on the murder. So the fresh appeal came two years ago. And Nicole, if you could show the, the final video, and this will give you a sense of the impact a killing, even that long ago, can have on a family. Thirty-five years ago, taxi driver George Murdoch was murdered by a misery passenger in Aberdeen. Dubbed the cheese wire murder, it sent shockwaves across the Granite City. Today, his family have launched a fresh appeal for justice. A warning, Ben Phillips' report contains images some viewers may find distressing. I think that person's a low life. They're never, ever, ever going to pick up the phone and say, well, you know, I've, I've had a change of heart. It was me. They're just not going to do that. 35 years ago, taxi driver George Murdoch was brutally murdered on the outskirts of Aberdeen. Today, his family and police have made a fresh appeal for information to catch his killer. When I think of Dodd, I, I always think of him with a smile on his face. He was a nice man. He was just a, a quiet, unassuming, just a gentle, gentle, kind man. We are still desperate today as we were then to have this... this Murder solved. 29th of September 1983, when 58-year-old George Murdoch is flagged down by a man in his 20s heading for Peter Cooter. Minutes later, he stops his car five miles short of his destination. Two teenagers on bikes witness a struggle and cycle for help, but it's too late. Seen here is a replica of a cheese wire used during the vicious attack. George suffered severe injuries to his head, face and neck and died at the scene. My husband and I went out the gate and um, we saw the car door open and Mr Murdoch was lying on the ground. Um, we did go over it but I couldn't feel a pulse. Weeks had passed when an employee at a nearby chip shop revealed they had served a man shortly after the attack whose hands were covered in blood. I'm totally sceptical about that, just totally sceptical. I just not that I've ever murdered somebody, but I just don't think I'm going to go into a chip shop and go get something to eat after doing something like that. George's brother, who appeared in a Grampian TV documentary, died without seeing justice served. I just want whoever is caught to uh, suffer now. They've been caught at the time. They've been out three years ago. If they're caught now, hopefully they'll be in there in prison till they die. Despite the passing of George's closest relatives, his extended family remain determined. They are offering a £10,000 reward for information while police make a review into the case. They say with developments in forensic techniques over the last three decades, vital evidence could now be recovered. George's murder remains unsolved. His killer remains out there. 
We think people may still have information about who murdered George. Can't believe that somebody doesn't know something or has an idea of somebody who may have been responsible. The conscience must be must be absolutely in turmoil with, with this, that they know about it or they suspect it and they haven't said anything. And I would say to them, for their sake and certainly for the family's sake, don't take it to your grave. George Murdoch's life was brought to an abrupt end through senseless violence at the hands of a complete stranger. Police believe someone somewhere knows something, but the question remains, will justice finally catch up with this mystery killer? Ben Phillip, STV News, Aberdeen. Finally, just to wrap up, uh, the, the, the family of George Murder can have hope. The detective in that report said it. There have been massive advances in DNA. Also, the, with the passage of time, allegiances sometimes loosen, and there's every chance that someone might come forward. They'll still have all the productions from the original case. You would think the cheese wire, which was used coincidentally to restrain him in the car to make him pull over, you'd think the cheese wire would yield some DNA clues. It's just that whoever did it is obviously not known to the police and they don't have that person's DNA. And if I can just mention two cases that we covered that have since been cleared up, one of them spans back 44 years and it's the murder of Rini McRae and her son Andrew in Inverness, her three-year-old son Andrew in 1976 and Sue Black, I don't know if you're still on Sue, but Sue was involved in, in that case. A man has been charged with that murder 44 years on and is due to go on trial, if not at the end of this year because it's such a strange year, certainly next year. And also the murder stretching back 42 years of brilliant Aberdeen scientist Brenda Page. She was killed in 1978 in Aberdeen. A man has also been charged with murdering Brenda Page and he's due to go on trial either at the end of this year or into next year. For, so for these families that have been caught up in the most horrendous events, there is still hope. I hope I haven't bored you too much over the past uh, hour and a half. Uh, it's an incredible time for everyone. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why you want to spend it uh, listening to me in such uh, troubled times. But stay safe, stay well, and stay sane. And I don't know if we have any time for questions, but if we have, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much. That was absolutely incredible. I'm sure everyone will agree. It was enthralling from start to finish. Um, so we are going to, if you're able to stay, please do. We'll have a few questions. Um, as I said, I'd just like you to keep them as short as possible and I will try and get to them all. I'll read them out uh, now. So let me see what the first one is. Um, so Alistair Lang is asking, he says, question about the Alistair Wilson murder. Thinking of JFK investigation, the bullet holes in the head would, I imagine, confirm whether Alistair was shot from front or back, i.e. from doorstep or inside house. If from inside, that would put suspicion on Veronica. If from doorstep, that would put, take suspicion off Veronica. Was the direction of shot confirmed by ballistics experts? He was shot in the doorstep. He was not shot inside the house. Okay, right, let me see if we've got any more. Um, okay, so Paul B is asking, is there any cases not having been investigated yet that you would like to take on like you have with these cases? Uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. Well, as I say, we took on, we took on 18, 18 cases and th there are, it, it sounds a bit callous to say it, but there, ha there have to be a particular kind of set of ingredients to make it a compelling case for us to take on we didn't we didn't cover any of the kind of what's what's known in kind of police circles as as bad on bad killings so these are kind of gangland feuds we also there, there have also been there have also been quite a few quite a few prostitute murders now that will be someone's daughter 
they'll have sisters, they'll have brothers or whatever, but it's quite difficult on these cases to get people to go on camera to talk about them. And most, most of the cases that we, we, we took on is where kind of ordinary people's lives were just thrown into complete and utter turmoil. And there was a circle of people willing to talk about it. And the other thing, which I should have mentioned at the start, in cases where there were suspects, we invited the suspects to take part in our program. And ev not surprisingly, uh, every one of them declined. And we, we then, in the public interest, tracked down the suspect and tried to get an interview with them on, on camera. And anyone, anyone who's seen any of the unsolved series will know some of the ones I'm, I'm referring to. But off, off the top of my head, I can't think, we, we even did the Bible John, the infamous Bible John killings in Glasgow. So we exhausted quite a few of the, the really intriguing, compelling ones. Great, thank you very much. Um, um, Al Taf is asking, how long was Mahmoud living in Orkney before the murder? He'd been there. He'd been there for. He'd been there for about eight, eight, eight weeks the previous year, and he'd been there for several weeks that summer. So he was, in fact, he'd been there eight months the previous year, and he was there several weeks that particular summer where where he was murdered. He was well known in the local community, though there is absolutely no evidence that he was known to the killer. Uh, the killer just wanted to kill someone who was a different skin colour. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? I think that's all that's in the chat at the moment. Um, we're being flooded with people saying that it's just such a fascinating uh, presentation, so it's obviously been very well enjoyed. Um, and people saying they're going to study criminal law. Um, this has been very helpful. Someone that teaches forensics. Um, so we've got, um, oh, we've got two more, I think. Um, Mike is asking, many of the, oh, sorry, it's just moved. Many of the murders were committed pre-social media. How much information does the press pick up about the murders, including possible suspects, which wouldn't have been out in the public rumor mill domain at that time? Well, so, so, there's there, there's no question that social media can harm a case, but social media can also hinder a case. And even though there was no social media when when we were we were doing the uh, our series of unsolved, it's or, or certainly the first series, it's inc it's incredible when when you go onto the the internet how much misinformation is out there about unsolved murder cases and. The direction to my direction to the team was to corroborate every piece of information, to check and double check it. And there was there was so much misinformation there. We didn't want to put any of that out in into the public domain. And you'll find that when you go on to to muster Google, that a lot of the stuff on there is is just a load of nonsense. OK, thank you. Um, Claire Henderson is asking um, about the Nairn murder. Was there any connection to someone who lived in the house previously? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, Clive Kennedy is asking, were there no fingerprints on the bullet in Orkney? No. Remember the, the, remember the bullet was fired from the self-loading pistol. So what they were desperate to find was the actual someone who had bullets. They were quite rare bullets being from the Kirky Arsenal. Someone who had the same type of bullet and the only person on the island that they found to have similar bullets was Eddie Ross, PC Eddie Ross. Okie dokie. Um, we've got um, A. Morrison is asking, how much do you think unregulated news pages on social media, such as FUBAR News, for example, in Aberdeen, would hinder cases now? I don't think, 
I honestly don't think they would. I think reputable journalists would not take what they read on FUBAR News as gospel. What FUBAR News is good for is alerting journalists to ongoing, ongoing events. FUBAR News also posts pictures, they post video. So in something like the, the, the flash flooding yesterday morning, for example, you know, if you went on to, if you go on to FUBAR News, there's quite a lot on there that the media, the media might want to report on and might want to show. But the key thing is that you contact whoever has taken that video to to ask for permission. But in in terms of kind of major criminal cases, you 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 wouldn't take anything that you read on Fubar News as gospel. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anyone else, or is that it for questions today? Give you one more chance. Oh, um, Pete Milne is asking, did you investigate the Dr. Brenda Page murder? We did indeed, Pete, and though I would love to talk about it, it's a, an active case. A man has been charged and a, a trial will take place either later this year or, or next year. But we, one, of, one of the programmes was about the, the Brenda Page case. Thank you very much. Um, let me see if we've got anyone else. <laughs> um, well, this is uh, all bit. Mike is asking any chance of another session from DJM covering. <laughs> no. I'm <laughs> sure <laughs> to get him to come back. <laughs> this has um, been stressful. <laughs> you've been fantastic. Um, Sheila Young has asked, um, would you come back and talk about the Rene McRae cases and Brenda Page cases after they're completed? I would be delighted to. That's the answer we were looking for. <laughs> okay, I think that's it for questions today. Um, it just leaves me to say thank you so, so much for taking the time to join us. Um, it's been interesting. Everyone was just absolutely enthralled for the past 90 minutes, the same as I was. I had to keep listening out for my cues to play the videos because um, I was getting too too wrapped up in what was happening. Um, so thank you so much, Donald, for taking the time um, to join us today. No, and, thanks. Uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, uh, thank you, Sue Black, for your, your kind words. And someone else has messaged, can Sue Black give a talk? So over to you soon. Oh, well, we'll have to try her next. <laughs> um, and the, 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 I've got to tell you that the, the chat is just flooded with everyone um, saying how much they've enjoyed the session today. So um, it's been fantastic. And thank you again. And um, we'll email out tomorrow the recording um, for everybody that joined us this afternoon as well. So you can relive it and share it with your friends. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Okay, bye. Bye.